Good afternoon. I am Mike Duffy, president of the Cape Cod Tufts Club. And on behalf of the club, I wanna welcome over 50 participants to today's presentation on a case of multiple identity, solving a mystery. In addition to members of the Tufts community, we have alumni from 22 schools around the country, including members of the intercollegiate alumni clubs of Cape Cod, representing local schools such as MIT, Yale, Harvard, BC, and Northeastern. A few housekeeping items before we start the program. This meeting will be recorded and uploaded to our Tufts Alumni YouTube channel. You will notice your audio and video are disabled. Once we begin, you will see the presenter on your screen. You'll be able to hear him, but he will not be able to hear or see you. You may need to adjust your volume. If you'd like to ask a question during the presentation, you can do so by clicking the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. This will open a window where you can type your questions. After the presentation, Amy will read the questions for our speaker to answer. Now I'm going to pass the video off to Sue Martin, a member of our board who will introduce today's speaker. Sue? Thanks, Mike. Hi, and uh, I'm very pleased to introduce today's speaker, David Martin. David is a retired professor and dean of the School of Education from Gallaudet University, uh, the University for the Deaf in Washington, D.C. He's in retirement. He is uh, president of the Marsons Mills Historical Society, treasurer of the Yale Club of Cape Cod. He teaches part time in the critical uh, thinking program at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. He is past president of the Cape Cod Genealogical Society and continues to be active in teaching genealogical courses. He has solved several challenging puzzles in family history and genealogy, and that, of course, is the subject of today's presentation. I am very pleased to present my husband, David Martin. Thank you very much, and I have to say that although I am not a graduate of Tufts, I feel an affinity for Tuftonians because when uh, we were in our courtship, I spent many uh, hours on the Tufts campus in Medford. Uh, today's presentation appears as if it is about a family history topic. And of course, in some ways it is, but it is also more than that because you may not be interested in my particular family history, uh, in the same way that you would be on your own. Also, some of us may have heard this before because I have given it on a previous occasion publicly about five years ago. But the point of this uh, introduction is that genealogy or family history also relates to general history. And that's what I'm hoping will happen today. Uh, I believe that we can see history and understand history in more depth, sometimes through individual or idiosyncratic individual stories about particular people. And so in a sense, although this is a kind of a detective story, I'm also hoping that through this, we can all get some additional insights into our mid 19th century and what was going on at the time and I'll be very happy to answer questions uh, at the end. And so uh, I'll begin with screen sharing the presentation at this point. And in historical mysteries, we often begin with a question. And in this particular instance, I was interested in finding out something that many of us want to find out, namely the parents of an ancestor. In this particular case, it was the uh, parents of a great great grandfather on my mother's side. And that's an innocent enough sounding uh, question or query to try to investigate. But the fact of the matter is, I ran into what genealogists call a real brick wall. 
In fact, it was a 30 year brick wall uh, where I picked up the problem, pursued it, had frustration, put it back and picked it up again uh, later and so on. And so one of the things we have to start with is what is it that we know? And there are only two bits of knowledge about this person whose name was John C. Fowler. And one was the copy of the population census of 1860. And secondly, was a marriage record. And of course, in 1860, the census taker was not uh, required to write down the names of parents. So that was no help. But also frustratingly, where you might expect a marriage record to list the parents of the bride and groom, there were no parents listed there at all. And in fact, in the 19th century, that often uh, is and was a problem in uh, family history investigations. And so I had to proceed from what we might say would be minimal knowledge in the background. Uh, I know it's hard to read, but uh, this is just an example uh, of the sample page of the 1860 census. And uh, you can see that at the very top in line one, it uh, is uh, not very clear, uh, but there is a, a, a person named Ellen Congdon and an Abby Fowler. And then the third line is as John C. Fowler, and uh, of course the uh, information is opposite that, age 26 and male, and his occupation was a, back, a blacksmith. Well, from other family history, I knew that Abby was his wife and that the first person listed there uh, was his mother-in-law. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, there's a, uh, the mother-in-law is on a previous page. Uh, but in any case, we have John C. Fowler married to Abby L. Fowler, and then some other people living in the household uh, at that same address. So to make it a little easier, I transcribed what was in there, and we can just review that. And the location was Montville, Connecticut, which is not very far from Norwich, if you're uh, familiar with Connecticut, and it's in New London County. So obviously with the information about him being age 26, one would uh, assume that you could go backward from there and find a birth date of somewhere around 1834. But that's just uh, a, 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 a sort of minimal calculation because the census does not do exact mathematics. And at the bottom of the screen, you see his mother-in-law, Mary P. Congdon, uh, female, age 51. Well, of course, I realized that the combination name of John Fowler would be very difficult to find because John is a highly common name and Fowler was a very common name at the time in New England. But I figured that, well, I had his middle initial, C, that ought to narrow things down and so I began to record what you see on the screen now, age 26, living in Montville and in the household of Mary P. Congdon with his wife, Abby Lamb, and their son, who was age three, uh, Francis Eugene uh, Fowler, who was my great grandfather. And it did give a birthplace of Canterbury, Connecticut. So here we go with what we think we have to go on. And I figured that it would be a pretty straightforward thing to look up John C. Fowler in Eastern Connecticut uh, in this time period that is uh, in the 1860s. Uh, this happens to be an old photograph of Montville and you can see that there was one factory. Uh, I'm not positive, but I think it may have been a clay factory represented by the uh, smokestack there. Um, and this picture was probably taken uh, in the 1870s. So it's a fairly contemporary picture uh, of the location. We know that John and Abby from a marriage record married in 1855, two years before their son was born. And that the marriage took place in Norwich, Connecticut. 
but there is no date of a, a specific uh, date and place uh, for uh, the parentage. And so therefore the problem persists, even though we have proof of the marriage and we have a location. And I'd like you to bear in mind that that location becomes quite important in a few moments. So let's remember Norwich, Connecticut. And so now we see that we can start the investigation. Well, the first thing you do, of course, is to go to the place where the birth supposedly took place and see if you can find a birth record, which is usually in a town hall. In New England, birth and marriage and death records are kept at the town level. Outside of New England, they're generally kept at the county level. If you're doing research on your own family, that's something uh, just to know about incidentally. And so I went to the Canterbury, Connecticut town clerk and found no record of the birth. I went to all three churches in Canterbury and uh, asked to see their records. I was never able to get into one of the three churches, but the other two uh, had no record of a, a baptism, which is an alternative to a birth record. And I went and searched, of course, several other communities other than Canterbury uh, and included Montville, even though uh, the record had said he'd been born in Canterbury, I figured, well, he was ending up living at age 26 in Montville, which is not too far away. I should check that anyway, and no luck. And so the investigation pursued and we started to look at some other possibilities. And I had read and then consulted with a professional genealogist about people living and groups in that area of Connecticut at the time. And I found a record that the Mohegan Native Americans lived in Eastern Connecticut and that they adopted English surnames rather early in 18th century, including the adoption of the name Fowler. And so, of course, I said, aha. Uh, and I was quite uh, intrigued by the fact that I might even have Native American ancestry. Um, I searched the tribal records and found that there uh, was a couple whose surname was Fowler and that they were of appropriate ages to have had a son, John, uh, or a son of any uh, name that was born in the 1830s. And lo and behold, I found John Collins Fowler. So there's the C, I've got it. However, a problem arose. It happens that the Mohegan Native Americans moved from Eastern Connecticut, at least a segment of them moved to Brothertown, New York to continue uh, their action as a community. And it was a place where the Connecticut Mohegans actually migrated. And so that record of John Collins Fowler was actually took, taking place in not Canterbury, Connecticut, but in uh, New York State, Eastern New York State. But I didn't let that bother me. And I figured, well, I've got to find out if I have any Native American ancestry. Perhaps this will give me a, 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 uh, some indication. National Geographic uh, was very early on the DNA scene. And I submitted uh, my saliva sample to the National Geographic and got the results back in terms of percentages of ethnicity. Um, and it came back for 0% Native American ancestry. And so that possibility, uh, in spite of the excitement, had to be put aside. Uh, of course, disappointment. And so we're back to square one. So then I began a visit to the Connecticut State Library in Hartford, which has an excellent genealogical section, and I used it more than once in this story. And I figured, well, let me look up all the, any other John C. Fowlers. And you can look here and you can see that six or perhaps seven people were possibly my John C. Fowler at that time 
uh, in that time period of the 1830s. So now the job became even more diverse. Uh, I found a John Calhoun Fowler. Well, good, we've got another C, but that was in Georgia. Another one was born in Minnesota. Another one in Bridgeport. Well, that's pretty close, but that's about nine years too early. A John Clinton Fowler born 10 years later in Lebanon, Connecticut. But look at that. He was married to Abby C. And of course, I know John Fowler, my John Fowler's wife's name uh, was Abby Congdon um, as uh, her maiden name. Uh, I got quite excited about that one, but I have to admit I was bothered by, of course, the date, although it could have been a recording date. There was a John Fowler without a C born in Woodstock in the right year, and that's not very far from Canterbury. And then there was a John C born uh, somewhere in the 1830s, that's the way they write it when they don't have a, a, a specific year. And that was in Connecticut. And then a John Chandler Fowler in Woodstock, which might have been the same one as the third from the bottom. But in any case, we have six or seven possibilities. None of them hit it exactly, but all of them in some way have possibilities. And so then I figured, well, let me go back to the Connecticut State Library and do some research on the wills to see if anybody in that time period had the surname Fowler and a will which named their son John as inheriting something, because that is sometimes a way of finding a missing ancestor. And there was an Amos Fowler, uh, but I have to tell you a little bit about the census before we talk about him. Up until the 1850 census, only the head of the household was listed by name. And then everyone else in the household was listed by gender and age only. And so the census taker, or what we call the enumerator, would put a tick mark in a column that I can show you uh, for any other people in the household according to their gender and their age. So all I know is that Amos Fowler had a son aged between five and nine in the 1840 census. Well, that's certainly in the right ballpark. And Anson, the same uh, in the 1840 census. And so two people could be possibilities, but that doesn't give us John's name. There was an Asa who was in the uh, 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 recorded as having a son born in 1837 and the Cornelius um, on, uh, uh, with his son born in 1833, very close to 1834. And I got excited about that one because the father is Cornelius. And I said, maybe that's what the C stands for in John C. Fowler's name. And then uh, there was an Edward who had a John C. born in 1844, again, too late. And I just added at the bottom the name of the Mohegan couple whom I had had to rule out, but uh, they were Jacob Fowler and his wife, Sally. So if we count uh, that as still uh, six possibilities taking that approach. Um, but I wasn't done yet. And I found a James who died in 1834, but had no will naming son John, and uh, a John Fowler who had no sons of the right age, a Robert with no will naming a son John uh, who died in 1834, another Robert who had a son under age five in 1840 in Canterbury. And that one really excited me, but then I found that this person had not gotten married until 1835. And John T. Fowler was born in 1833 or 34. Not impossible biologically, of course, but also not likely in that time period. And finally, a Whedon uh, who had a son, John C. Fowler, but again, the years were not definitive. So I really have only expanded the task I haven't come to any solution at this point. 
And this is at the point where I said, I've got to put this aside. And I waited a couple of years uh, for perhaps the availability of new information, which comes available uh, from time to time, of course. They did have the son, as I mentioned before, who was born in 1857, and that uh, person is my uh, great grandfather. It, but then something else happened in the story of my John C. Fowler, and that is that he and Abby got divorced. Uh, in 1867, as you can barely make out there, and it's interesting because there is actually a published book called Divorces in the Connecticut. Uh, very useful for genealogists. I uh, don't haven't run across that in too many other cases. But in any case, uh, that means that they are no longer married. However, the 1870 census still lists John C. Fowler living in the same household with his mother-in-law, Mary Congdon, as head of household, and his former wife, Abby. And so I began to think, now, how could that be? They divorced in 1867, and the 1870 says it still has him there. Uh, did they need to keep him around to have someone to take out the trash every week? Um, and of course, that's a cynical comment, but I was really at a loss to figure that out. But then his former wife remarries. I found a marriage record for, to a John Smith, 1873. And right after that, their son, Frank, my great-grandfather, filed for guardianship with his mother, Abby, at the time of her remarriage, and that was granted by the court. So that means that the breakup of the family is certainly final by that point. But I'm still not any closer to the answer to the question. So I decided to backpedal and go into uh, a little bit of previous history and look at federal records related to military enlistment. And uh, there are uh, wonderful uh, resources of that nature in the records of the National Archives. <clears throat> I had uh, continued to look at the 1880 census just to see where John C. Fowler was at that time, because I would think it would be unlikely that he would still be living with his former wife, Abby. And indeed, the 1880 census says that John C. Fowler was living with his wife, Fanny de Moranville, in Jamaica in Queens, New York. Now, I don't have time to go back, but if we went back to the original slide that showed the census of 1860 and listing everybody in the household. Among the other people listed in the household was a Fanny with a different surname. And I figured, ha ha, perhaps she was a servant or a boarder in the house. And John had struck up a relationship with her and then ended up marrying her. However, that was a different Fanny with a different surname. And so that uh, sort of intriguing possibility went by the board. He is listed in the 1880 census as a contractor, no longer blacksmith, uh, but I did look up in the New York City directory for the same year to see if that information was consistent. And it was, uh, the uh, address was given, uh, the wife and the profession. Now, I still don't know for sure if I've got the right John C. Fowler, who is in New York now. And so that is when I then turned to the next resource, which is the federal military records. And I found that there was a draft card for John C. Fowler in June of 1861, age 25, that's correct, they estimated his birth year as 1836, but that's, of course, uh, wrong if you do, do the math. It has the right birthplace. Um, and of course, this is an official uh, document that we can use uh, for uh, a genealogical record. 
So I figured, well, let me follow this line instead uh, through the military connections. He enlists in the Union Navy in New York as 1862 and is uh, considered age 25 at the time. He is listed as married to Abby Congdon at the time of enlistment. And that works out because they didn't get divorced until 1867. And then his record of service, which is again, federally available. He serves on board a frigate, the Roanoke. He serves on the famous ironclad ship, the Monitor that had that terrible battle with the South Merrimack. And he was uh, serving on that in the same year. Then he's reported to have had a debility of the lungs and the nervous system and was sent back to the Brooklyn Naval Hospital for so-called recovery. Well, there's a picture of the frigate, uh, the Roanoke, which uh, was his first ship of service. And then uh, this is the famous picture of the monitor in the Merrimack. The monitor is the one, of course, on the left with the uh, Union flag. And uh, I'd like you to bear in mind this particular uh, slide because, of course, it shows active gunfire. Naturally, this is a painting uh, rather than a photograph, although photography had been in existence since 1840, but uh, there was not a photographer uh, at the scene, apparently. Uh, but I'm particularly focusing on the volume of smoke and the, uh, uh, the brightness of the flashes from the cannons, uh, because that will have a connection with some information that I'm going to share with you uh, in just a few minutes about his pension application. So uh, we don't know if he was actually in that particular battle because of course the monitor engaged other wooden ships of the South uh, with success. And of course, these were the first ships ever made uh, from, uh, from metal. And so here's the Brooklyn Naval Hospital where he spent some months in recovery. And he apparently really wanted to get back in the Navy. Uh, and uh, uh, so, what I did was I asked then for the National Archives to send me his pension application file, which was an envelope, eight by 11 envelope, two inches thick, two inches thick. And I just want to say, uh, if you have any ancestor who may have served in the military, spend the money to have a copy made of the pension application because sometimes as it's true in this case it is filled with very rich meat and without that i would never have solved the mystery it cost me 80 dollars, and i'd say it's the best 80 dollars i ever spent uh, in any kind of genealogical pursuit and i think you'll see why in a few moments so he applies for a pension and in the pension file, this thick envelope are all kinds of letters and documents and historical things recorded by the Union Navy, uh, as well as uh, letters from other people that we'll see shortly. Well, there's a preliminary medical diagnosis during the war that says he has symptoms of syphilis. All right. and so. Uh, he was hospitalized because of those symptoms. In 1864, after coming out of the Naval Hospital, he tries to re-enlist in 1864, and he figures they might not let him back in because he's not really cured yet. And so he changes his name to Juan C. Fowler. Uh, and of course, he was uh, his uh, deceit was discovered. And he actually, there is a letter in the file that uh, admits that he was uh, had lied, or he, had, he referred to it as his error. But he was allowed to volunteer now on a third ship, which was the Vanderbilt. And during that time, there's a letter that says he suffered a concussion 
from the cannon discharge of the ship he was on. And what I'm hypothesizing here is it wasn't the cannon discharge of the Vanderbilt, which was a regular three-masted wooden ship, but it was a cannon discharge from the Monitor, which had a very powerful cannon and was uh, some new technology at the time. There's a letter also that says that he is developing progressive paralysis and that he was discharged in 1865. And there's a letter that says he marries Fanny de Moranville in 1873. Well, all that is beginning to coalesce, but still hasn't solved the original question of who are his parents. There's a picture of the Vanderbilt. And you can see it was actually a hybrid ship. It was a combination of sailing and steamship both. Uh, so it used sail as, as well as engines. In his pension application, he applies uh, for a pension and had asked doctors to submit an attestation on his physical condition. Uh, the letters go back and forth and back and forth. They finally, uh, there's a letter from a doctor that says his syphilis is now ruled out as a cause of his physical condition. And he is diagnosed instead as having locomotor ataxia. Locomotor ataxia, if you look it up in a medical journal, uh, is a condition in which your limbs, both arms and legs, are, uh, have very jerky motions. Uh, and in uh, only under certain circumstances, but it's something that can be uh, very debilitating. And the, well, it was one doctor that thought this was a very unusual case. And so that doctor published a medical journal article in 1878 in the American Journal of Medical Sciences uh, as a case study of something that would be of interest to other doctors. Uh, now, of course, uh, privacy was an issue in 1878 the way it is today. So they only used his initials. Uh, so he was referred to as JCF, but it is, of course, uh, clearly John C. Fowler. And uh, I've never had the experience before of seeing a medical journal article about an ancestor. So I thought that was uh, uh, at least unique for me. There's also a letter where he's writing back once again to the government for his pension and he's describing uh, his work in New York in the 1870s as I'm doing all I could do. And that is substantiated by a doctor's letter that says uh, John C. Fowler is doing all he could do given his physical condition. Uh, so this gives you, by the way, uh, an example of the kind of data that you can find in a pension file that you wouldn't find anywhere else unless it happened to be in a family album uh, of some kind that had been tucked away. There was also a letter, and this is where we begin to unravel the mystery. It says, John and Fanny, his second wife, got married at the home of Wilbur in Greenville, Connecticut, which is located near Norwich at his quote, sister's home, aha. So the marriage record of Mary Fowler who married Jay Wilbur lists her father as Charles Fowler. And therefore we have a connection that we would call indirect in genealogy Mary is therefore concluded to be John's sister. And therefore, by extension, we can say, we think we may have the father's name finally. To buttress that, there was another letter in the file from Diana Fowler Spaulding saying that uh, she had known her brother, John C., quote, since infancy. And that's another letter of attestation. And I confirmed that Diana Fowler Spaulding and Harvey Spaulding were married in 1845. So what do we know now? Well, 
we know that John is married second to family, and he has two siblings, Mary and Diana, and a pension file had personal letters from both Mary and Diana. And then there's a separate marriage information in the file for Fanny saying she married John Cottle Fowler. Finally, we have another angle on the initial C. But I wasn't done yet because I wanted to have confirmation in another way with other documents about these two siblings of John C. Fowler. And so I went back once again to the Connecticut State Library and went through all the wills of people who uh, were, uh, would have died between a certain time period to see if they had named John C. Fowler as an heir. And I did uh, found that the will of Charles W. Fowler bequeathed parts of his estate in 1873, a year before he died, to his daughters, Mary Fowler Wilbur and Diana Fowley Spaulding. That's confirmation, although I remain puzzled about why John was not referred to in Charles's will at all. It could be that uh, the father felt that John had strayed or that uh, getting a divorce and remarried was something that they, he didn't approve of, or he could have felt that John uh, didn't need anything. But the fact that we have the documentation of Diana and Mary being sisters of the person we're trying to find the parentage of uh, would be a, considered a confirmation. I continued to do the research to see if there were other siblings and I did find that there was a Godfrey and a Samuel. And Samuel's middle name, which is a brother of John, uh, Frank is the name that was given uh, by uh, John and Abby to their son, uh, Frank, who was, as I said, my great grandfather. So now let's stand back and finish the story before we look at what do we gain from all this. So the end of the actual biographical story is that they moved in 1881 to Denver from New York because they hoped that the climate would improve his physical health. Uh, it, <clears throat> his deteriorating physical condition was of concern and we have uh, some information about that. And he did improve for a while and then it again deteriorated. The pension application was turned down, however, by the government in 1888, just months before he died. And he died on the 5th of May in 1888. And the date on the headstone gives his birth as September 1834. And uh, this is a picture taken at the Riverside Cemetery in Denver. And interestingly enough, although it's a little fuzzy to read, is he has two gravestones. The one on the right is the family one, and the one on the left is the government one, because the government gave uh, uh, headstones, of course, to all veterans. Well, that must mean that even though his pension was denied, somehow the government decided that he deserved that, because that one is clearly newer than the one uh, that's on your right. And so, Pursuing one last bit of information, I found that uh, we have a pursuit of the pension application by his now widow, Fanny, and she's allowed to do that. And she finally got the pension granted in 1890, two years later. Uh, she gets an award for persistence. And of course it, uh, provided her with uh, some income. And she died in 1909, a lot later, in Kansas. So uh, this is a picture of her gravestone in Kansas. And now to conclude the particular mystery, uh, we've got uh, uh, the father name and there was able to find uh, the mother's name through their marriage record and uh, just for interest, I wanted to know where the father came from. 
and he was born in Rhode Island, uh, lived for a time in New York State, but then came back to Canterbury uh, and died in 1873. And so uh, he's in the right place at the right time to have a son, John. Uh, that's a picture from the family album that we think is John C. Fowler. And I must comment that I said, I think he looked like a little bit of a rake to me, but uh, you can draw your own conclusions. Um, and, and then I, I just included a, a, a picture coming up of his son, Frank, or my great grandfather, uh, who was, uh, I understand he died only two years after I was born, but he was a very straight laced, very proper gentleman who owned a spice business in New Bedford. Uh, for the purposes of the family, uh, I made this chart. Uh, that's of no great interest to uh, our audience today, but it just shows the, the lineage of each of the seven generations, starting with the known parent of John, namely Charles. But now uh, to summarize this, I'm going to do two things. First, I want to summarize the sources of data that were used. And that's what you have on the current slide. Uh, and this is a list of the kinds of resources that you have to make sure of that you're turning over enough uh, earth to pursue your, uh, your mystery. Uh, town directories, town clerks, divorce records, and so on. Uh, I'll give you a minute to just scan that. And you'll notice that I put three asterisks next to the pension application on the US military, because of course, that thick envelope that uh, had all those letters of attestation was the key to break it open. So uh, if you were to make a list of uh, these um, uh, 16 items, this would be a sort of a checklist that you could use if you're trying to track down some mystery in your own family history. But secondly, I just wanted to finish with some general advice. If you're searching for a, a, an unknown ancestor or some kind of connection that is a mystery for you. Uh, first is don't give up, <laughs> keep going, set it aside, come back to it uh, because new data become available all the time through the digitization process that's going uh, like crazy right now. And uh, which is a very good thing for family historians. Uh, secondly, of course, obviously try multiple strategies, which was the previous slide. And then a third one is examine your assumptions. Don't conclude that what you've assumed all along is necessarily cast in stone. And sometimes in a frustrating thing, you have to go backward and say, I think maybe we need to start from a different starting point or a different assumption. Partnering with a fellow genealogists helps a lot. And of course, the military pension thing is not to be forgotten. Try to confirm in some way with a second source, everything that you are asserting. Uh, we don't have the luxury of being able to do that in every case. Sometimes uh, we have only one record and there's nothing to corroborate it, but that's better than nothing. However, corroboration with at least uh, one more source of a different kind would be, uh, is always desirable. So we're talking about, for example, a birth record. So you might have a birth record that came from a town clerk. So that you might go to a church to see if there's a baptism record. That would be considered to be uh, a supportive kind of document. Uh, obviously be organized and, uh, and according to the types of information that you're doing. And uh, one of the patterns that I have found very useful is to make a timeline of the person whom you're trying to track down uh, from birth to death and all the events in between to help you conceptualize the lifetime. And, and of course, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in one minute. Big thing, 
consider collateral lines. You can't just necessarily go direct from your, per, your person back to uh, or down to a future generation. We have to consider siblings and cousins. And it was the case of these two siblings that broke this open. Also don't assume that what's in the record about the location of an event, like birth, marriage, or death, is necessarily correct. An event could have occurred in one town, but recorded in the next town. And then the last two things, make a connection with the general uh, story of life. First of all, in the person's life story, we uh, have to realize that our ancestors were not just numbers and places of birth, marriage, and death, that they had a life that they lived and events that took place and activities. And so we want to try to construct that. And we can do that as we discover more information. And then lastly, connect their life story also with contemporary events that were going on. In John C. Fowler's case, it was really easy because he was in the Civil War. Uh, but it wasn't just the Civil War, it was events within the Civil War, things that he uh, might have witnessed or heard about, things that were happening at the same time uh, that is, it would somehow been in his general life context. And so that is a case study that I'm hoping is something where you can take some ideas um, and of course uh, go far beyond the particular individual which is uh, uh, merely a case study through which we can see history. So at this point uh, I'll uh, stop the screen share and I'll be able to welcome questions. Hi everyone, and thank you, Dave, again. That was truly fascinating and has me already, the wheels going in my head as to which family members I need to contact and, and which pension applications I'm gonna start ordering. But I just wanna get to some of the audience questions. Again, if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, one question that came up actually more than once is basically, is this story over for you? Or are you going to, start pursuing Charles Fowler a little bit more? Because I know you you mentioned you keep finding things and things come up as years go by and more records come up. So where where, do, where to next, Dave? Uh, that's a great question. And the story is not over because uh, I have now pursued uh, more data on the background of Charles Fowler and I've been able to push the genealogy back two further generations. Uh, before it comes to a, a halt. So uh, yeah, in a sense, of course, we have to realize that you're never done really. <laughs> and then another a question that came up was, you mentioned the Naval Enlistment Record as being an official document. Are there certain documents or sources in your list that are considered more official or more reliable? Yes, um, anything that is, uh, from a, a governmental office or bureau, uh, which of course would be obtainable through the National Archives, unless it is for some reason uh, still secret, would be considered to be official. However, I do wanna add that even official records can have errors. Uh, let's face it, official records are made by human beings and human beings are fallible, or they may receive information that they write down, which turns out not to have been true, even though it's not their own fault. So official records are something that you would uh, certainly aim for, but just take them with a grain of salt. And that's where the idea of having corroboration from a second source would come in uh, to be very useful if you can do it. And is there kind of, I, I know it got my wheels turning, but for anyone who's watching at home, you know, you, you did that great list of sources. Is there a first step that people should do? Should they contact, you know, their local library or talk to their relatives or talk to a genealogist? You know, where, where's the detective story start? Well, we usually uh, say that the best advice is to start with you and go backward rather than the other way around. 
And so uh, if you start with you and your data uh, and make a, what we call a pedigree chart, which lists you, your parents, your parents' parents, and so forth, and go back maybe just four generations, then when you do that, you will see the holes that need to be filled. Oh, I can't find the birth date of my maternal grandmother. Well, that means something I've got to pursue. So that is uh, the starting point. And then as far as the first source of data is concerned, um, I recommend going uh, to a town clerk or a city clerk to find whatever official information is available. I also have a list of uh, sources that genealogists can use, and I'd be happy to send that to anyone uh, as a, a kind of a checklist. Um, and uh, so my email is uh, uh, David Martin Dr. like doctor at AOL.com. So uh, if you'd like to, a, a checklist of things not to miss in family history, uh, just send me an email. Thanks. That was actually a, a comment that came in about the, your last your last few slides about those tips that you um, offered as well as sources, if those can be shared. So we can do that also, um, if that's possible, and send it out after the event to the people who've attended. That would um, be then fine. There, yeah, there's a specific question about, do you know how they determine how much to charge for those pension records? Like, is that something that's an easy thing to do as long as you pay for whatever they tell you to pay for, or is that more of a complication? Um, the National Archives, which is the repository for these, has two different price categories. You can get uh, an abbreviated version of the pension file. At the time I did it, it was $25. I think it's probably in the 30s now. Uh, or you can ask for the complete pension file, which as I said, was $80, and that's probably closer to 100 now. Um, but uh, uh, because I wanted everything, uh, whereas the uh, abbreviated file would have just uh, some of the more basic information without a lot of the letters that went back and forth about it. Uh, but the National Archives, whose website is nara.gov, nara.gov, is the uh, one that you would uh, consult to find out their current policies and pricing structure. Uh, I actually went personally to the National Archives in Washington uh, to get a mine, but uh, they, they will uh, mail it. Um, great, there was also a comment about it being a different process if you are the granddaughter or you know, you're know you coming from an immigrant family. Do you have an experience in that or where someone can start to look for that? Yes, uh, from an immigrant family, uh, a, a very important uh, place to, to start is looking for immigration records. And I'm going to give you the name of one website that is very helpful and helps you cut through some of the bureaucracy that the National Archives uh, has. And that website is uh, uh, developed by a very uh, unselfish person named Stephen Morris. And uh, his web address is stevemorse.org, S-T-E-V-E-M-O-R-S-E.org. And Steve has, uh, if you open that up, a list of passenger lists and immigration records that you can click on. Uh, he also has all information on uh, obtaining information from censuses as well as some other sources. So it's a very useful website. Uh, and uh, from the uh, immigration records and passenger lists, uh, you can go on from there. Um, if someone is searching for immigrant ancestry and that doesn't work, uh, send me an email because that's a whole separate topic unto itself that John C. Fowler didn't have since he was uh, born of American parents. And so the question, people are really fascinated by the story. Did you go and travel around to Colorado and take those pictures or is that all stuff you found online? Uh, I found the uh, Riverside Cemetery in Denver pictures online, but uh, on my bucket list is to visit that cemetery. I really want to, but I did travel uh, frequently to Connecticut 
as well mm -hmm. as to Boston in searching uh, the information on that, including visiting town halls uh, in Connecticut, as well as the uh, Connecticut Archives and Connecticut State Library, and a number of cemeteries. Uh, I didn't include that in my list because I never found a lot of information on the, in the cemetery that I didn't have another way, but you should add cemetery searching to that list. Um, and people are also fascinated just by the length of time and kind of your drive to do this. Um, how did you maintain that drive? I mean, did you keep a written log of, you know, all your research just so you kind of keep track of stuff? I know at one point we had like six Johns and where we had to go from there. Right. Well, I use what many people do uh, as a genealogical software. And there are four or five uh, different software programs that you can purchase for under $40. And you can enter your data as you discover it. And it, by the way, it's well worth doing. And that helps you to organize your data. But I also keep paper files. And so I had a, 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 a growing, thickening file folder for John C. Fowler, where I made copies and filed uh, any data that I, I had up to that point. So that it was easy to refer to uh, as I picked up the problem after giving myself a rest. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got time for one last question. I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. Um, is this something you were always interested in? Did you, like you said, just kind of map back your family and see a hole? Or was there a family story that kind of prompted this? Um, and then we'll turn it over to Mike after this. I was very fortunate. Uh, my paternal grandfather was an amateur genealogist, uh, a very serious one, who in the 1930s did a great deal of research and kept uh, three ring binders of typewritten and handwritten notes, uh, very meticulous. And that was handed down to me through my father and sparked my interest in genealogy at a pretty early age. Uh, I think I was in, uh, in high school when I first saw these things as an amazing piece of work. And I vividly remember my paternal grandmother saying to me, if we have to go to another cemetery this weekend, I'm going to, <laughs> and so on, you fill in the rest, uh, because that was how he spent all of his free time is doing research. So that's how that my interest was sparked. Great, thanks. And I, I wanna thank you again for your time. And I'm gonna turn this back over to uh, Mike uh, Duffy to end this. And everyone, thank you again for joining us. Thank you. Let's get Mike up here. We don't see or hear you, Mike, if you're there. Okay, okay, there, I there am. we go. There, there you go, here you are. Okay, thank you, Dr. Martin for that interesting and stimulating pre presentation. I think you've encouraged me maybe to go out and do a little genealogy myself, <laughs> although I do suffer from the immigration problem. Uh, but, and to our attendees, we appreciate your participation we hope you will complete a brief two-minute survey, which will be appearing shortly on your screen, and you will receive as a reminder tomorrow via email. These virtual events have helped us raise substantial funding for the Cape Cod Tufts Club's scholarship fund. If you are so inclined, we hope you will consider making a gift to this fund. Amy will post that link now so you can do so online. Finally, I would like to invite everyone to join us on June 26th, when we will once again meet in person for our annual meeting at the Doubletree Hilton in Hyannis. We will be announcing this year's scholarship winners at this meeting. So watch for a registration email that will be sent to all of you soon. Have a wonderful rest of the day and please stay safe and be well. Good afternoon.